couple of times. And uh, I want to talk about uh, uh, my mega engineering initiative, and that is the grand challenges. And I know this is an old topic, and you're thinking to yourself, oh, we've heard this before. This has been around. Grand challenges came out in 2008. What is there really to know here? And um, well, I think there is something to know, and that's why I want to spend this time to, to talk about it a bit. And um, basically, I, I think that uh, we really want to talk about um, uh, the framing of the grand challenges. I don't think the grand challenges are uh, understood completely, actually. The way, the way it has been presented out since 2008, it's come out as 14 projects that need to get done. Uh, th th that's not exactly right, actually. And the reason this is important is this is going to be a major initiative of the National Academy of Engineering and either and other academies around the world, as a matter of fact, too. So we need to get the question right to begin with. So I want to, those of you who even think you know about this very well, I, I'd like to just take this opportunity to uh, see if our own academy will uh, concur with my thinking about the grand challenges uh, so that when I present our academy's vision to others around the planet, uh, I will be uh, correctly representing our academy's vision from your perspective as well. Now, there's really three questions here that, that I want to talk about. You know, what, you know what, are, what are the grand challenges and where do they come from and why? Not a bad start. Secondly, what is this Grand Challenge Scholars Program? And why is this program needed at all? And, and why is it a National Academy of Engineering initiative and not somebody else's? And then, of course, I, sh I need to talk a little bit about the Global Grand Challenges Summit. These summits are basically summits that are put on by three academies. The, the Royal Academy of Engineering, the Chinese Academy of Engineering, and the U.S. National Academy of Eng Engineering put on these summits. And the third one will be in Washington, D.C. in a year, July 18 to 20, 2017. So that's, that's basically, the, these are the points I want to make today. These are the kind of takeaway points. So the first one is, of course, where do they come from and why? So let's ratchet back to 2003. 2003, this book came out, Century of Innovation. And this, uh, this basically identified the 20 greatest achievements of the 20th century. And uh, this book was published, and these 20 greatest achievements were analyzed, and they're ranked in order. Number one was essentially electrification of the country. Number two was the automobile. Number three was airplane. Number four was water distribution system. Number 11 was a uh, interstate highway system. Number 19 was nuclear energy, all right? So, and when you look, go down these 20 great achievements of the 20th century, you can't help but be blown away from them on a technical sense. Uh, they were, they were uh, technologies at a grand scale that were created by engineering and other related enterprises, of course, uh, over this period. And this book um, stimulated the question about what's next. Uh, typically, when you, when, when, you win, when you win the game, when you win the World Series, the, next, the first question you get by the press is, what's next? You're going to win next year. So, so that's basically what happened here. Uh, now, one thing to think about with this book, it, this book ha actually had rather little impact. You know, it, it, the impact was sort of like a dictionary. It was, it was looking backward. It was a record of what had happened. Uh, it didn't actually set any direction to the future. No one has ever referenced to these 20 great achievements of the 20th century, as great as they were, as the stimulus for the future. I've never seen that done. But nonetheless, uh, the first question came, well, what will, what will engineering achieve in the 21st century? You know, okay, we've taken care of the 20th, what about the 21st? And pretty soon, people see, realize right away, you cannot predict what's gonna happen in the 21st century. You can't even predict 10 years from now or five years from now, let alone 100. So, so that is not a question you can answer with any kind of credibility or confidence. However, there's a different question you could ask. And once again, this emphasizes the importance of asking the right question. If you don't ask the right question, you never get anywhere. So this, this was, what is a vision for what engineering needs to achieve in the 21st century? What it needs to achieve in the 21st century? That is uh, the first time in history that anyone has posed this question for engineering. What does it need to achieve? Then you say, well, then you say that vision idea has promise, but then vision to do what? Is it economic vision? You know, is it a, a health vision? I mean, so you can think of lots of visions you could have 
for engineering. So this team, this expert team of the Grand Challenge Committee started to work on this basically to do what question to create the vision for the 21st century. And they got hundreds, thousands of inputs from around the world and they pondered this question for a year uh, and they uh, finally came forward with a vision what needed to be done. And this vision that they got went back to the root of what engineering is about. Instead of gadgets for automobiles or gadgets for aircraft or ga gadgets for the internet or so forth, they came back to the root and that is serving people and society. Engineers cre engineering creates solutions for people and society. They went back to this basic idea. And therefore, to do what had to do with people and society. And so they created a vision statement. And this is the part that's been lost. Even for people who think they know about the grand challenges, you probably have never actually thought about what is the vision that underpins the grand challenges. And this is a very important idea. It's kind of, it's the linking fundamental idea. So they came up with a vision statement, and this is our crafting of their vision statement. Continuation of, the vision is continuation of life on the planet, making our world more sustainable, safe, healthful, and joyful. Joyful. Healthy and joyful. So this, this is, a, a, as I said, the most powerful vision that, that probably you could come up with. It's the first time that, that we've ever had a vision for the planet from engineering. <laughs> And of course, it's life on the planet. It's not human life on the planet. It's the planet. It's not a university. It's not a country. It's not a company. It's the planet. And, um, and it's sustainable, safe, healthy, and joyful. The planet, safe, basically safe, healthy, joyful, and sustainable. I mean, that is enormously powerful. So then, like any great engineering plan, you, got, you have this vision of where you're going. This is, this is a destination, a century-long de destination. Then, of course, you need goals you know, that you're going to achieve. You have to achieve these goals also for the planet as well. And they spent a year to develop the goals that would essentially deliver this vision. All right. So the goals we call the grand challenges for engineering. There are 14 grand challenges for engineering. And the idea is if these goals are satisfied, everywhere on the planet, that, that therefore the vision can be achieved. So th the important thing is that these goals are actually serving this vision. The, the analogy is, if you want to design a personal mobility device like an automobile, what are the goals for having an automobile that, uh, would, let's say, that would move people from place to place independently as they would like? Th there'd be a set of goals required to do that. You need an engine, you need brakes, you have to stop it somehow or other, you need lights, you have want to drive in the evening, you need highways, you need filling stations, you need all these elements which would be goals for the automobile. But you might say, well, the brakes and the lights are independent units. It, they're not independent units because they actually, they're, they're not independent if you look at the, at the vision for a personal mobility device, which requires them. So the grand challenges look like independent, uh, 14 independent entities, but they're not independent. They're required to, to deliver the vision. And that's the part that gets has gotten lost since 2008 when, when this was actually presented. They are actually coupled in the requirement for the vision. If you don't care about the vision, then you can have any number of grand challenges you like. But if you actually want to deliver something of that scale, you, they actually ha have to be delivered together. And that distinguishes these grand challenges from every other set of grand challenges I have been able to identify from any field uh, in the planet at, at the moment. Okay. So that's the deal. So satisfying these goals is, is, the, is the issue. Now, uh, at this point, what are the grand challenges? And I'll just, I just don't want to talk about any great detail, just, just very, very, very quickly. You make solar energy economical, provide energy from fusion, develop carbon sequestration methods, manage the nitrogen cycle, provide access to clean water. That, that is access not only for the 800 million people that don't have it today, but for the two or three more billion people who would that will be born in, the, in this century. And that includes people who don't have any water today, those who have only contaminated water. So you see that this tells you right away that you're talking about solutions of various types in different parts of the planet for the water problems that exist in those locations. So it just give you a sense of the scale and the complexity of, of the challenges. Then of course, restore, restore and improve urban infrastructure. I think that pretty much speaks for itself. Advance health informatics, engineer better medicines, 
reverse engineering the brain. That, that's another great uh, topic, and that reminds us of, of the Obama administration's grand challenge that was announced in 2013 called the Brain Initiative. And that brain initiative, of course, is very well supported. It had uh, six, I think, six hundred million dollars of support. Is it six hundred, three hundred? Anyway, many hundreds of million dollars of support in 2016. Uh, you know, it's big, big numbers, uh, and it's necessary to have that kind of funding for do this uh, understanding the brain problem, which will feed this grand challenge: reverse engineering the brain knowledge, and of course, prevent nuclear terror and secure cyberspace. Two issues that are kind of on the table today, as we know well. Uh, enhanced virtual reality, advanced personalized learning, engineer the tools of scientific discovery. And we'll, we'll hear two plenary lectures on the tools of scientific discovery today, as a matter of fact. So uh, what you can see is these challenges, people are working on these challenges, and that's to be expected. So you can really, you can really think of um, this, uh, this vision for, uh, for getting these challenges from two perspectives. One perspective is uh, picking out the challenge, one, of the, one or more of the challenges and address it directly, uh, like Obama's Brain Initiative, for example. Uh, or you can think of it another way, that is you, you have to get these solutions to these problems and these solutions are gonna come basically uh, by either taking the challenges on directly, we might call that the initiative group, or another way of approaching it is taking it on from the point of view of the workforce. That is developing a workforce that has the thinking and the capacities, develops the capacities for taking on problems of this scale. Large, international, multidisciplinary, multicultural initiatives that have, that have uh, very, comp very complex systems and get that in the thinking of the students early. So the initiative group is, is, is underway and uh, there's great prospects for it. And I, I think that was the thought of the uh, original committee, and this is only eight years into it, right? So, so it's, uh, it's very um, in inspiring. But then there's also a track for the talent group. Who's taking care of the talent group? That is developing the talent for problems of this scale. And that's what this value is about, is the Grand Challenge Scholars Program is listed at the bottom of that graphic. And that is really about the talent group. And the, the Grand Challenge Scholars Program really is a, is a absolutely brilliant idea. I wish I could take credit for it. It, it was done by, by uh, 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 Dean Tom Katsileas, who was dean, at the time he was dean at Duke University, now he's provost at, at Virginia, University of Virginia. And, and he was the, the lead, gets the credit for being the leader of this, but also Janis Jotsos, who was the dean at USC, was his partner, and, and, and Rick Miller, who is the president of Olin College of Engineering. They had this idea in 2009 for this program. <coughs> and, th <coughs> and this is a brilliant program, I have to say. I mean, those of you who are academics, you can think about this problem. If you want to create a program in your university or college, and you want to have the university down the street, I mean like, you know, 100 yards away, pick up this program, what's the likelihood you could make that happen? Close to zero, close to zero. At least if, it, if it's not zero, it's gonna take years to get it to done. There's gonna be endless reasons why it can't be done. Uh, and, and I won't go through the details, but it's, in short, it's extremely hard to port a program even to another university in the same culture, in the same circumstance, to take it. Now we're talking about a program that will be ported around the planet again. That is, it's gonna be in Bangladesh, it's gonna be in India, it's gonna be in Africa, it's gonna be in the Middle East, US, UK, so forth. So what's the probability you could create a program that you could actually port around the planet in such a way that those universities and colleges and those places would be stoked about the whole thing. They'd be excited. They'd want to go, they'd grapple for it. They'd come, they'd come clamoring to get into it. What's the probability of that happening? I'm sure you'd say that's close to zero, too. But as a matter of fact, it's not close to zero. In fact, it's happening as we speak. Now, think about that. Uh, how, how can this be true? How can this be true? Since it's so difficult to do. Well, it's done because of the brilliance of the program was it did not actually create a program in a traditional sense. It did not have a curriculum. It, it did, not, not have a, did not have a sense of steps and, pro, and how, ma how many hours of this and how many hours of that and how many laboratories and this kind of thing. No, it didn't have any of that. Instead, what it did, it looked at competencies of the students, looked at the outcomes. That is, the program has really a simple set of fundamental outcomes that need to be 
um, uh, in, uh, taught and adopted by the students in that university's programs. So, so the Grand Challenge Scholars Program is really a set of five outcomes. And, and then the university and the uh, students can figure out how they're going to get that, how they're going to get that outcome. So the program requires basically student competency in five areas, and, and these are not normally found in an engineering program. And then each university can figure out how it's going to happen. It could be part of the regular course of study, it could be part of a special program, some, summer study, it's up to the university to figure it out. And if a university basically has to say uh, that they're going to do it, how they're going to do it, and that then the university is going to evaluate whether the students achieve this competency. That's the idea. And the, the, five, the five issues are very, uh, very straightforward. Uh, research project experience, that is technical competence. There's a technical competence uh, on a grand challenge like topic is, is one. Two, multidisciplinary. The students have to have a, a real understanding from personal experience of what it means to be a highly multidisciplinary operation and, and engage in that. And it's not just engineering working with mathematics. You know, it's really, you know, it's medicine, it's, it's uh, international relations, it's all kinds of stuff when you're working on global multidisciplinary problems, you know, and uh, the kinds of things that are extremely important. Um, there has to be a viable business in this solution somehow or other. If there's not a viable business, whatever solution you have won't be implemented. <laughs> it just won't happen. Therefore, you have to think about viable business creations, uh, and it, it, that can determine what kind of solution you head for. And students have to get that early in this process. It's not just someone else is going to figure out how to do it. You have to think that in, in your mind. And, uh, and so that, that's the th third uh, uh, competency they have to have through experience. Fourth, multiculturalism. You're, you're working now, uh, solutions are not for your own uh, city and, and community and state. They're, they're all over the planet. They're, they're, you, these solutions have to work in the culture where they're going to be Im embedded. And you have to understand what that means and how difficult that is and how much care you have to take. And there are endless examples of failures of engineering solutions because they didn't take into account the cultural differences of where the solution is going to be implemented. You know, Americans have this kind of idea that everybody will just adopt our culture and be happy for it. Oh, not even close to correct, of course. <laughs> so we have a lot of uh, experience. So they have, students have to get that, clearly. And you don't necessarily get that from inside the United States uh, alone, because you tend to think of it only a one culture kind of idea. And then, of course, the idea of social consciousness. That is, you have to understand that these, these efforts are all about serving people in society. Uh, and if you don't have a sense or appreciate the value of serving people in society, you're not going to be successful at this. You probably shouldn't be in the program. So basically, these are the five competencies, research, multidisciplinarity, business, multiculturalism, social consciousness. And the, and the Grand Challenge Scholars Program is the universities on the planet have to propose how they're going to embed these ideas in their students and how they're going to evaluate whether they have done so. And then if they do, they get a certificate saying, congratulations, you're a Grand Challenge Scholar. They get a letter from me congratulating them for being a Grand Challenge Scholar. And they can hang it on the wall or whatever they want to do with it, bathroom probably. Um, <laughs> but but, that, but that's the, that is the Grand Challenge Scholars program. Designed to be not, not put it, pushing off universities, drawing them in, leaving as much flexibility as possible in terms of how they execute, but looking at the outcomes of it. And frankly, from my point of view, these are five great ideas that probably are useful for every engineering student in every domain, but for the Grand Challenge Scholars right now, th this is what creates the Grand Challenge Scholars program. Uh, so we had a meeting here in 2015 over 100 deans of engineering around the country uh, came here. That's about a third of all deans of engineering in the United States. Shows the convening power of the academy, by the way. Uh, we talked about the Grand Challenge Scholars Program, uh, how much uh, we wanted to uh, inform the president that we we're going to do this. Uh, and uh, we wrote a letter committing to the president to uh, great, uh, oh, my uh, screen has gone out here somehow or other. Oh, sorry. OK, thank you for that. I seem to be, uh, I don't know what's happened exactly. Uh, some, there's some sort of a screw up here, but nonetheless, uh, um, we, uh, I, I essentially went to Obama's uh, uh, office in the White House. 
I presented, I'm presenting here in this picture a letter that was uh, signed by 120 something deans of engineering at the time saying they were committing to this Grand Challenge Scholars Program. Now, there's two things about this. Another issue here to, to note, there were 16 Grand Challenge Scholars Program in the United States at this time, 16. Now we have over 120 uh, of them uh, have signed this program. No one has promised them any money. You, yeah, I mean, if those of you in academics, you know if, if the deans won't do anything without money, they don't have money, so therefore they always want to know where, who's going to pay for it before anything starts. There was no, no financial commitments there. But yet, the idea was so powerful that they said, we have to do this. And they signed, they signed up for this as well. Well, beyond that, of course, uh, I said there are other countries in it. So right now, we've got nine, Austra not nine universities in Australia. We have universities in Botswana, China, Egypt, Hong Kong, India, Kuwait, Malaysia, Singapore, UK, as well as here. They've all taken on these kinds of programs as well. Once again, all driven by the idea. There's no money behind it. There's no, there's no government or no UN or no World Bank. There's no, there's no supports for these programs. Just people really drawn to this idea. Uh, in, uh, uh, on June the 1st of this year, I, was, I, was, I gave a, a plenary talk to the Chinese Academy of Engineering uh, on why China ought to sign up for this and China should join the, the NAE in pushing this Grand Challenge College program around the planet. You know, and that way we'd get essentially a large fraction of the planet moving on this whole thing. And I got lots of very, <coughs> very effective uh, responses from, from the uh, Chinese Academy of Engineering members and even some business, business people in China about this. They were uh, stoked about this. On November the 7th, I'm going to Seoul to give a talk before the World Engineering Education Forum and the Global Engineering Dean's Council. They say there's gonna be 1,000 to 1,500 people there from 70 countries. And my idea is to sell them on this Grand Challenge Scholars Program and how they should go forward with this as well. <coughs> We're starting a coordinating office here. Uh, the, the Academy is putting together a coordinating office to, to actually provide the first coordination for this activity. Up to now, it's all been grassroots level. No funding, no supports, no organization. All done university by university independently of each other. Uh, so there's, we need to uh, have some coordination so good ideas can be transmitted between one university and another for those that are, have programs and those that want to have programs. We need to uh, kind of memorialize the achievements and the progress that are making and the students involved in this. And we also need a way of, of, of uh, monitoring the uh, subsequent achievement of the students and what happens to them. Does their experience in this program and their experiences actually uh, have an effect on what they do in their life? professional life. Uh, now this program has, has actually taken a lot of uh, counsel from Confucius from 25 centuries ago. You know, Confucius said, uh, um, uh, I hear and I forget, I read and I remember, but I do and I understand. And this is all about doing. This is all about doing. It's about doing in the, in the research side, it's about doing in multidisciplinarity, doing in multiculturalism. Basically, it's doing in social consciousness through service learning. So, so the, the, the doing elements of, of these five uh, competencies are all, are all part of the idea as well. So that's what the program is, and, uh, and that is, this is the only part that's developing the talent base for these grand challenges. So we're, we're gonna see how far this will go, and we'll, we'll see uh, you know, over time uh, how, how much it's picked up, uh, depending on whether people see it as valuable as, as I see it. Let me just switch for a moment to talk about the, the Global Grand Challenge Summits that I mentioned. We've had two before. We had one in London in 2013, one in Beijing in 2015. The third one is here in Washington, D.C. in uh, July 18 to 20, 2017. And basically, these summits essentially uh, uh, give some update on how we're doing on various grand challenges. You know, maybe virtual reality, maybe reverse engine of the brain. We'll have a kind of uh, updates uh, lectures. We'll also have current activities and re research on them. Uh, large component of students, in fact, at this July 7, 18 to 20 meeting, there'll be 800 people planned for this, quite a large crowd. Half of them will be students, and uh, be maybe 200 uh, adults, as it were, or whatever, non-students, and, and 200 students from the U.S., and 100 uh, adults and uh, 100 students from China, 100 and uh, students and adults from each from uh, the UK as well. Once again, to, to build the enterprise here. And, and these, these are three academy grand challenges 
Chinese, British, and U.S. academies sponsoring it. Um, so uh, the, I won't go into the details of this, but, but this summit is uh, uh, particularly uh, uh, Im uh, impressive because it's a kind of a global reach for the challenges. The one, one addition to this summit from the other two, if you've been with or in, engaged with the other two, is this time we have uh, a new partnership with uh, basically FIRST Robotics that you probably heard about. Uh, first, is, FIRST Global is a new FIRST Robotics enterprise, and FIRST Robotics is taking on an international uh, event on a grand challenge topic, so we have a connection to the grand challenges with FIRST Robotics, which will be on July uh, 17 and 18, uh, just before the July 18 and 20 summit in Washington, D.C. So that the one day they'll overlap with each other. Um, there'll be a grand challenge to uh, topic for the robotics competition, and the uh, advisors to that topic will be the presidents of the three academies, engineering, Ch Chinese, and British academies, will be the advisors on the grand challenge topic as well. And of course, from our perspective and our interest, this connects the grand challenges now to FIRST Robotics. The comp competitors will be aged 14 to 18. We have never connected to that group before. But FIRST Robotics itself has participants aged 5 to 18. So once again, we reach into that younger population, their parents, their teachers, their supporters, which is very large on a global scale because FIRST Robotics is in 86 countries. So uh, once again, it's the kind of growth of this, of this activity on, on a global scale. So just a couple of points to note. I probably talked too long already. A couple of points to note at the end. Uh, one is, uh, basically, the grand challenges are mega engineering problems. And they're, they're possibly the best description of engineering for the public because they illustrate the answer to two important questions that we usually answer poorly. One is, what is engineering? And how does engineering serve people in society? These are two critical questions that we have failed on for a long time. But, but the grand challenges do that perfectly. Secondly, the vision statement really calls for local solutions to the grand challenges. In other words, it, it's a global problem, and it's problems for the planet, but it requires sets of local solutions that, that have to be solved everywhere. So it's really a, a, a compendium of solutions. And we need other national academies and organizations to, to take up the charge as well so that they can uh, see that they get embedded locally. Right? That's why the Grand Challenge Scholars Program is really the vehicle, the entree, to get into these local communities so that those uh, uh, national academies and organizations in those other countries will ha have a reason to take up the, the grand challenges for essentially the local solutions of the grand challenges. So there's a, a lot of elements to the connectivity of this whole process. And by the way, students are highly inspired. Many of these universities are in involved in this because their students pushed them to do it. You know, as, as Winston Churchill said, if you're under 30 and not a liberal, you have no heart. And I think that we, we, see, it, we see that happening here. He also said if you're over 30 and not a conservative, you have no head, but I won't believe that. <laughs> we, don't, we, don't, we don't put that in here. Um, so, um, but they certainly are inspired by over 50% of the students in the Grand Challenge program are females. Only 18% of engineering students in the United States are females. They're attracted to this because it's about people, it's about society, it's about social issues. And of course, we have learned long ago that the females are attracted to bioengineering and environmental issues and grand challenges for that very reason. It's a very important idea. So uh, with that, I think I thank you very much for listening to me, and I'm hoping my doing my best to uh, recruit you to support the grand